Paul has been an entrepreneur. Uh, he has certainly been a, a president of a number of startups, and he's currently a vice, vice president of uh, strategic development at MDA, probably one of Canada's largest uh, technology companies. And if not necessarily the largest, it's probably our most valuable technology company. If you remember a few years ago, uh, a US company, a very large US military company wanted to buy MDA for a, a, a lot of money. And the sale was blocked by the Canadian government because felt that MDA is too valuable to Canada to be sold to Americans. And that's because of significant technology it holds, both in not only in space, in military, in, 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 in satellite business. And Paul's job is to help MDA in its strategic development and, and investment. Um, Paul is also uh, on the board of Family Outreach and Response, which is a community-based uh, uh, services in, in, in Toronto. He's going to tell us a little bit about the, uh, how, to, uh, how the urge to explore is an important component of uh, drive towards innovation. Paul, it's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, I'm gonna try something different. I like to prowl around a bit while I talk. Um, so MDA is, as Iran just said, one of Canada's largest technology companies. It's perhaps best known for being Canada's space company, in particular, the company that built the Canada Arm and all the follow-up things to the Canada Arm. So I am gonna give you a dose of space and I'm gonna jump back and forth between um, space and ground. Um, and what I was really interested in was I wanted to think a bit <clears throat> about innovation. So, as you've heard, innovation is really important. Why? Because it drives the creation of wealth. When I was an entrepreneur, at some point I realized that wealth creation can be translated into a much simpler phrase, which is make money, which is a very good thing to do. And <laughs> it's probably a good idea to think about what's the wellspring of innovation and <clears throat> where does it come from, what's the inspiration? So I'm gonna start with a picture that I really encourage you to sort of look at and absorb. So, <clears throat> while you're kind of absorbing the kind of awe and majesty of this, I'm gonna talk about, I'm gonna talk over it for a couple of minutes. So this is an actual photograph. So there's an actual guy there hanging at the end of that arm. That's the Canada Arm II. And it's kind of interesting to think about, how did this come about? How did he get there? And for that matter, how did that robot get there and why? And I think that the answer to the first question is sort of interesting. People went into space fundamentally because it was a pretty cool thing to do. At some point, people realized we're smart enough to actually get there, and they kind of wanted to go. It's a very sort of primal thing to want to go see something and be somewhere that no one's been before. And <clears throat> at some point it took like 3% of the US GNP for a sustained, on a sustained basis for close to a decade. But we did in fact establish that people could get into space. And then later on, there became this question, can, man, can mankind, can people, can men and women sort of le learn to live and work in space and how do they actually get things done in space? So there's a whole bunch of things in this picture that are, are kind of obvious but not so obvious. Yeah, you can't breathe there, so that's kind of a problem. You can't really, you know, you're kind of, you're handicapped in a lot of ways. And one of the things they found out early on in the history of the space shuttle was they, they wanted to have astronauts out in space able to actually do things, in particular fix stuff. Fixing stuff is a pretty pr sort of also fundamental human activity. And they discovered that there's a big problem with astronauts floating in space. You know the first spacewalk where they went outside the Gemini, I think it was a Gemini, and they float around, it was a really cool thing. But when you're floating around, you basically, you can't, you can't do much. And so they, they, they started looking around at what was in space. At the, the genesis of the Canada Arm was it was, a, it was basically a satellite deployment crane. So the space shuttle was this pickup truck that took satellites into space and they wanted to get them out of the back of the pickup truck, and that's what the Canada Arm was for. And then they had these astronauts up there, and they're like, wait a minute, we have this robot thing. I wonder if we can put people on the end of the robot. Hey, good idea. 
took a long, long time to get there. Let me tell you a little bit about why, especially then I'm now talking to the young roboticists in the audience. <clears throat> it's, it, arms are, you know, arms, the point is there's a lot of different ways to get the tip of the arm from one place to another. And when you're writing the software to do that, you have a lot of choices. And I see my friend right here in the audience is telling you exactly what you don't want to have happen, which is if you have an astronaut on the end of the arm, you don't want it to do this. That would be really bad. And it took many, many years before NASA and the Canadian Space Agency and all the engineers involved in this actually trusted the CanadArm software to be able to essentially be safe. And just an, another minor point about robots in space. When you're in a vacuum, oil doesn't work too good. You know, and, and you can't easily get to the things you're building and replace them. And I'm, I'm going to come back to this in, in a minute. So there was many, many innovations that had to occur for um, robots to be there in space with human beings on the end of them actually doing um, fundamentally useful activities. Here's another extremely profound picture when you really contemplate it. This one is an actual picture. I'm going to show you a few artist's impressions in a minute. So this, of course, is the surface of Mars. So Mars is 225 million kilometers away. It's a long way. I mean, it's nowhere near as far as the nearest galaxies, but it's a long way. How far is it? It's far enough that it takes radio waves traveling at the speed of light 15 minutes to get there, roughly. It depends on exactly how far they are apart. 15 minutes to get there and 15 minutes to get back. Okay, to the robotics team members, I have to tell you, this, this really throws a wrench in your Wi-Fi control plans because, you know, you send the command and then you, you wonder what's happened and you hope it didn't do something wrong and then half an hour later you find out, ooh, ooh that wasn't too good. And so there's an enormous premium on getting things to work right in space and particularly on Mars. So here's that, there's this robot arm, which by the way was built by MDA, and it contains actual, actual uh, Martian dirt, which is about to be dumped into an instrument to be analyzed. This is from the Phoenix lander. And <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of things that better, they better bloody well work right. The joints better work right, the lubrication better work right, you can't touch it again. The overall thing to get it there costs about a billion and a half dollars. If a wire breaks, that's a big problem. And so um, MDA and all the businesses that are in space, fundamentally, by the way, why is this here? Again, it's because somebody decided it would be, worth, it would be worthwhile on behalf of the human race to look around and see what's going on on Mars. See if there's water on Mars, see if there's life on Mars, see if we could walk around on Mars, and I'll come back to that. Um, and so they, they built this whole thing, and that, that urge drove a big process of innovation in a whole variety of in, uh, complicated technologies and safety and reliability first and foremost among them. So what does that allow you to do? So this is perhaps the least dramatic picture I have to show you, but the story behind this picture is mind-boggling. So this is a robot that MDA built here in Toronto which was used to, to <clears throat> go inside the Pickering nuclear reactor. So let me tell you about Pickering. So Pickering was built a long time ago, long enough that they're worried about it now, and it would be bad if things went wrong inside the nuclear reactor at Pickering. This is, by the way, was used for an operational uh, part of Pickering. Some of Pickering's been shut down. In this case, they wanted to basically look at some struts that were structurally critical to holding the thing together, okay? Meanwhile, the Pickering nuclear reactor is probably worth about $2 billion. So you don't really want to have a problem with it if you can avoid it. And when it's running, it's earning OPG maybe $10 million a day. So when you want to check it out, you don't want to shut it down for too long. Okay, so here's what they needed to do. They needed to go right into the core of the reactor and they needed to get up close to these struts and they needed to put some instruments on them and actually wire brush them and make sure that they weren't too rusty and the thing, basically, and the thing wasn't going to fall apart. The only central problem with this is where they wanted to do this was right in the guts of the thing where all the nuclear fuel is sitting called the Calandria Vault, which is full of uh, neutrons flying around, aka it was extremely radioactive and it's been radioactive for like 25 years. And not, so 
And then the last part that's interesting is the robot had to go in through a hole about this big. There's not too many ways to get in there for good reason. It had to go in through a hole about this big and had to reach basically the distance from here to the far wall of that thing. And it had to do that without moving more than about a millimeter off of its planned, uh, planned trajectory. And when it did that, it had to go into this radioactive environment through this little hole, and it had to kind of swerve and dodge around a whole bunch of pipes and get to the far side of this thing and scrape and, and analyze the steel. So <clears throat> this, and this, by the way, was almost like a moonshot. This project was mind-bogglingly well engineered because it had to be, it had to work. It couldn't shut down the reactor for very long. I mean, one thing you don't want to have happen in this situation is you don't want your arm to get stuck. That would be really bad. I mean, that could actually write off the whole reactor. So I'm, I'm proud to report that this worked to perfection. It was part of a multi-day shutdown about two weeks, about two years ago. And the robot went in there, and in fact, they were very pleased. The, the, the number one risk they had for keeping Pickering running at this time was to make sure that these structural struts were actually going to last for another 10 years, which is, you know, another, um, it keeps your, pre by the way, when you get electricity from Pickering and the other nuclear generating stations in Canada, when they're up and running smoothly, it's the cheapest power by far that you can get from, from all the various sources of power. So this is an example of wealth creation from innovation that was driven by inspiration to explore in space. Here's another one. This one's closer to um, what you saw in the video from Dr. Anvari at the beginning of the show. This was an earlier robotic surgery um, uh, spin-out from exploration in space. I would just tell you, tell especially the young engineers up and coming. The engineers in Brampton that, that built this, uh, one, of, one of the leads of whom is sitting here in the audience, Roughly, I think, you know, the underlying assumption here was like, you know, we've done the Canada Arm, we've done Mars, you know, we're rocket scientists, how hard could brain surgery actually be? Um, so it's all fine and dandy to talk about part of robotics, which is moving things around. Um, <clears throat> another part of it is, and it's really become the crucial frontier for space robotics and for robotics on the ground, is how to understand the world around you if you're a robot, if you're a computer program. How to build sensors, how to get data back from your sensors, and how to, how to fundamentally understand how to act on the basis of that. So this is an artist, the big picture is an artist's impression of the Phoenix lander. The Phoenix lander was active on Mars about three years ago, so this actually did make it to Mars. It landed near the poles of Mars. Um, <clears throat> it, it deployed those two solar wings. And on that thing there, that thing that's emitting the green laser light, that was built by MDA in Brampton also. That's called a LIDAR. And so this is, ba this is basically a sensor for exploring the atmosphere. In the bottom corner, that's the actual thing. It's about this big. And it, sh it shot this laser beam way high into the atmosphere. It was actually uh, built in combination with another Toronto company called Optech, where they had been building these laser instruments for the exploration of atmospheres and Earth for many years. So what do you beam a uh, laser into the atmosphere for, and how does it help you understand the atmosphere in, in Mars? And the answer is, you, you use it like a radar, and you, you measure the reflection of the laser beam bouncing off particles in the atmosphere. And from that, you can learn all sorts of things about the atmosphere, including where, where the edge of the atmosphere is, what's in there, how much water vapor is in there, which is pretty cool if you're looking around Mars, how much dust is in there, which is really critical if you're trying to contemplate what it might be to be on Mars for a long time period. And <clears throat> so that's what this guy did. He landed on Mars, he was beaming up into spa into, towards space, and they were all the scientists and all the software that all the various technologists built, including MDA, was being used to analyze this. And a very surprising thing happened, which you may have seen in the newspaper. I felt that it should have been front page news, but I can still tout it for now. So much to the amazement of everyone, when this instrument was sensing the atmosphere on Mars, it was meant to be sort of looking for dust devils and, and, and things like that. One day they, they were puzzling over the data and they, they realized that what they had seen with the laser atm atmospheric analysis instrument was snow falling on Mars. How, what, could be <clears throat> what could be better than Canada discovering snow? Of course, there was a small twist, which is the snow is made of carbon dioxide, it's not made of water. Um, but still, it's very, and I mean, literally until that point, no one had any idea that snow fell on Mars. Um, and by the way, I don't know if I can go backwards with this thing. By the way, 
what ultimately <coughs> was one of the factors that shut Phoenix down on Mars is combination of dust and snow fell on the solar power wings. When, when your solar power wings are covered in snow and you don't have a shoveler around, it's not too good. Um, <coughs> okay, um, this now is a more recent rover on Mars. It's part of the Mars Science Lab uh, project. This rover is called um, Curiosity. And um, MDA and Canada built the arm on this, which, or parts of it anyway, which has all sorts of interesting things. It reaches into rocks and tries to grind them up and get samples and stuff. But what Brampton built for this thing is down in the corner of this is an advanced instrument called an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer. What it does is you put it up close to a rock and it has a little radioactive source in it and it interacts with the chemicals in the rock and then the this, this spectrometer senses what's coming back and you can actually tell what the, the chemistry of the, what that rock is made out of. Um, a, pretty profound, a pretty profound achievement. So assuming, I think, ah, right. So this is called OSIRIS-REx. This hasn't flown yet. We're in the middle, middle of building this instrument. This instrument's for analyzing the shape of the surface of an asteroid so that you can make a smart plan about how to land on it. Again, it's using information from the bouncing back of a laser beam to build a detailed surface map, uh, which can help you understand the geology and also how to interact with the thing so the arm can reach out, the thing can land if it wants to land, et cetera. You get the idea. So where does this all go? Once you get an expertise about understanding how to um, process and understand the sensory signals coming back from robots, what does that allow you to build? So this is a pretty cool picture. So we did this project with a big, huge mining equipment company called Atlas Copco, the second or third largest mining equipment company in the world. And one of the things that robots are good at is managing tasks where it's dirty, dull, or dangerous, the 3Ds. And underground mines are all three of those things. And this is called a load haul dump vehicle. And they travel in very narrow tunnels. When they're driven by human beings, the drivers typically let the thing run into the wall a lot on the way from where it's picked up its load to where it dumps its load. And it's very dangerous, and it's not something you particularly want to do. And if you're Atlas Copco, you want to be able to offer your customers um, a way to do this without human beings smashing into the wall. So this picture was from the acceptance test of the software and sensors that allow this vehicle to drive itself. So it's actually going over 40 kilometers an hour in this picture, and um, it didn't hit the walls. And it's basically the same exact spirit of innovation and technology of understanding the systems, uh, sensory signals coming back from robotic sensors that allowed us to do that. I have one more. I don't know, some of you may recognize this. It's all fine and dandy to have a Google vehicle driving itself, but this is way cooler. So this is a, this is a Bombardier ATV. And this guy is equipped with all sorts of sensors, same kind, that can sense things in 3D, can take pictures, can find things in the way like rocks. And um, we're basically at MDA, we're in the middle of technology innovation in which we're both looking at how to drive rovers on Mars by themselves reliably, as well as um, potentially build technology to allow, for example, um, auxiliary safety systems on ATVs, et cetera. Uh, this is just the coolest thing since sliced bread. Um, I want to, to sort of finish off. I want to return to space to just sort of tease you with what innovations might have to come next. So this is a picture that NASA produced a couple of years ago. Um, and when we got this picture, we roboticists, we love this picture. If you're a technology innovator and you look at something like this, it's like you can see money everywhere in that picture that you look, okay? That's one way to think of it. I mean, another way is if we want to go back to Mars or, or uh, back to the moon or Mars and actually explore, this is probably the kind of equipment that we need to build. We need to build, you know, these big vehicles where we can climb in and that have all sorts of robot arms on them. We need to build um, more advanced technology of all kinds. There's a little rover in the picture. You know, basically when, Mankind, people and robots working hand, hand in hand to explore, the, explore space is what this picture is all about. It's a marvelous opportunity. 
and it'll come, and so will all the innovation, and so will all the value driven back into the economy of Canada and the United States. Uh, sorry, Canada and the world is what I meant to say. Um, <clears throat> so this last picture is sort of literally and figuratively far out, and I couldn't resist using it. I'm curious if anybody in the audience recognizes what this is. Okay, you will in a moment. And to give credit, what I'm about to tell you is from a speech I heard by a, a friend of mine, Bob McDonald, that many of you know from his science reporting on CBC. So this is a, an artist's impression of the tallest volcano known to man, the tallest volcano in the solar system. It's on Mars. It's called Olympus Mons. So this sucker is 25 kilometers high, okay? And the coolest thing about this is it's very tall, but it's not so steep. It's only got like a 5% grade in the middle. And it would be possible if you were there quite easily to walk from the bottom to the top. And one of the things that's kind of interesting to contemplate about that is you, Mars has an atmosphere, not such a dense atmosphere, but it has enough of an atmosphere that you know, you're walking around in an atmosphere. When you get to the top of Olympus Mars, you've walked right into outer space. This is kind of a mind-boggling idea, and Bob McDonald, he, he put it out there as one of the up-and-coming tourist destinations. You know, forget climbing Kilimanjaro in Africa. I mean, if you want to climb, if you want to explore, this is what you want to think about. And in the context of what I'm trying to say today, I, the, the interesting question is, what would this take? And when will this occur? And actually, I've been doing a lot of hiking with my two daughters, and what I've been puzzling about in the context of this since I put this slide in this deck is, you know, you kind of, the moleskin situation is a big problem because you've got to have a spacesuit on. Like, there's a lot of problems. If you, there's got to be a lot of innovations before this, this exploration happens. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it is out there, and it would be very cool. So that's it. <laughs>